the Amstrad 2086-30. As that badge suggests, this 1988 computer features an 8 MHz 8086 CPU and a 30 MB hard drive. The system memory comes in at a fairly typical 640K, very much an XT class system, but with a specification uplifted from the original IBM machine, as Amstrad's offering also sports a 720K double density floppy drive and an integrated VGA display adapter. Launched in 1988 for the entry price of £600 to include the computer only with just a single floppy drive, our machine with its hard drive and 14 inch colour VGA monitor, well that would have set you back a cool £1350 or over three and a half grand when adjusted for inflation. I have had this sitting in the collection for a couple of years now, although I've done very little with it. When I did initially get it, well at that time, the computer itself, that worked. The monitor though, it had a problem. The vertical on it was sort of squished. So I was putting that down to bad capacitors and we will take a look inside here later on today. But when I plugged this in earlier on to see if the computer still works, well, it sort of starts for a split second and then shuts off. So it seems to have developed a fault in here somewhere. Let's start with that. Let's get this over to the bench, take it apart and see if we can't figure out what's wrong. Getting into this is really straightforward. If we take that screw out, well that allows this back section to unclip. Exposing the three available 8-bit ISA slots Yes, that is rust down in there. Unfortunately, the metalwork on this machine has suffered a little bit of corrosion, but we will see if there's anything we can do about that. But to get the rest of the case apart, it's just a matter of removing those two screws. The three expansion slot covers, they need to come off, and then there are two screws at the front underneath those. As you can maybe see through the slots there where I removed those brackets, there is a bit of plastic there, much like was on the top here. There is a cover on the side here for the expansions for when they're not in use. And probably best to remove that as well. So this should just lift off now. The cable from the batteries here. This machine just uses four AA batteries for its uh, BIOS backup. And yes, there's a little bit of corrosion on that terminal there, which we'll need to address later as well. But that cable has already been disconnected. That's where it plugs in there. Lots of dust. There is the hard drive controller. A lot of the information I can find online says that this is an RLL hard drive. But for some reason, I had it in the back of my mind that this was actually an XT class hard drive in here. And certainly XT drives do use 40 pin ribbon, you know, a 40 pin connector there. Much like IDE does. But I suppose we'll know better when we get the actual drive itself out. We can look at the model number on it. I suspect, or rather I hope, that the reason that this machine is only powering on for a second and then suddenly turning off is because we may have something shorted on the motherboard. Possibly a shorted tantalum possibly on the 12 volt rail, and the power supply is detecting that. It's protecting itself, it's shutting down. But we'll not know until we do get this all apart. So let's just continue stripping it down. So that whole thing is the power supply. The cable cannot be disconnected from the machine. But we can just pull that out of there for now and put that to the side. That rust. Well, it is annoying and you can maybe see there that it has also spread onto some of the ports at the rear. So we will need to have a think about what we can do with that. But let's just continue the teardown. You certainly like your long screws, Amstrad. Because those screws, all those screws are doing is going through that little bit of metal there and all the rest of that is down into those. 
a screw that length would have done fine. Let's get the floppy drive out. And yet again, more comically long screws. Oh, there's that whole front panel just fell off. And look at that. So presumably that's a knockout for the version of this machine that comes with the two disc drives. And in fact, there are standoffs here for mounting another disc drive. So yeah, that makes sense. And that is us more or less in. I will take the board out in a second. But first of all, let's just bring you down a bit closer and have a look at some of this. So there's a key on the side of the case here. And it was in that position, which if we look just inside here, all that key's doing is pressing that switch. In its current location, that switch is closed. And those black and green wires there, they run to this point beside the keyboard connector. So the assumption would be that that switch just disables the keyboard. I don't think that switch itself would stop the machine from powering on. There is the PC speaker. I need to disconnect that wire as well. And then on the other side, it really is a mess of wires, isn't it? This ribbon cable here, this goes to the floppy, but it also comes back and goes to this PCB here with a further ribbon coming off that, presumably for the other optional internal floppy. This board here, well, we have a port here, labeled drive signals, and we have a power output. So presumably for connecting an external floppy disk drive, and then you can switch between internal or external. But presumably said switch would only be selecting between internal second disk drive, fed off this cable, or an external drive. So we can't disconnect this floppy ribbon can disconnect that one which goes to the motherboard but unfortunately most of the rest of these wires they are all hard fixed to the motherboard they are not coming off they're soldered directly to it i suppose just part of the cost saving exercise that Armstrong did with all of his various bits of hardware but it does just make things a little bit awkward for us right now so just a few more screws to remove then we'll lift the motherboard out and we'll take a closer look at that. And so there it is, our Amstrad, part number Z70901, copyright 1988. MC0059B is that the revision of this board. There's the brains of the operation, the processor, an AMD branded 8086-2. Copyright Intel 1978. This chip goes back to the days when AMD, well, they would have just licensed the chip design off Intel and manufactured their own. Unlike in later years when they designed their own chips and went into more direct competition with Intel, say with the K5 or K6, or even nowadays with the Ryzen chips. But I assume that's the BIOS. Three Amstrad packages here, presumably our chipset. This package down here, a UM8272A. I would imagine given the proximity to the floppy ribbon, that is going to be the floppy disk controller. This machine only does support double density floppy disk drives. And just looking up that part number, yeah, it seems to be the case that that chip only supports double density drives. So that will limit us to 720K disks. But I wonder if it would be possible to swap that out to a controller that does support the high density disks, and then we could use 1.44 meg disks on this computer. Not too sure what this Toshiba chip is. T4750, and I can't really find anything looking on Google either, so anyone know what that's doing? Over here, I would have to assume that this is our real-time clock, given the proximity of that little crystal on the trim pot. A Paradise VGA chip. And I would assume that is the VGA BIOS. And here, I would have to assume that is the VGA memory. MT RAM chips. These are 4067s. So those are each 64K by 4 bit. Two chips gives us 64K of RAM. 64, 128, 256 total. That would make sense for the display. 
Working over this way, we have another Amstrad chip here. 40049. That, I believe, is controlling the serial port. The actual system memory itself, well, it's all down here. We have another four of those MT RAM chips. So that would be 128K of RAM there. Over here, these NEC branded chips, the four of them, well, they are 424256, so 4-bit 256K, so 256512. Add the 1-8 to, to that, and that is our 640K of RAM. These chips in between them, though, well, those two are 1-bit by 256K. Those two are 1-bit by 64K. So would that be parity for those? That's what I would assume, anyway. But all that aside, the more pressing matter here is why did it not work? What is shorted? Now, I did speculate that perhaps a shorted tantalum, but uh, I don't see any tantalums on this board. We can check here, though, where the power supply connects for any shorts on any of the voltage rails. So the power supply connects both here and here. 5 volt connects at those two pins. Then we have three grounds, and then 12 volt connects there. On this, we have two grounds in the middle. One of them is negative 5, the other is negative 12. I'm not too sure which way around it is. But are there any shorts anywhere between any of the voltage rails? So between 5 volt and ground, nope, that's okay. Between ground and 12 volt, nope, that's okay as well. And what about the negative voltage rails? Yeah, all that is fine. So nothing wrong here, but I suppose it might be worth a quick look inside the power supply itself. Well, certainly from an initial visual inspection, everything in here looks fine. None of those caps look like they've bulged. Nothing looks like it's leaked. It actually looks to be a very solid power supply. We have individual trim pots down here where we can adjust 5 volt, 12 volt, negative 5 and negative 12, I believe. But that one's interesting, 12 volt protect. And it certainly was behaving as if it was going into like a protection mode, like it was shutting itself down. Thinking about it, there's probably nothing on that motherboard that's using 12 volt. That would only be going through to the hard drive and maybe the floppy drive. I wonder if there's something wrong on one of those. Starting with the floppy drive, that's a Citizen drive. And we can see there on this label, and it says DC 5 volt. I don't think this thing actually has 12 volt coming up to it. And indeed, if we look on the motherboard, well, there's the power cable that goes up to the floppy drive. And as you can see, it only has 5 volt on ground on it. But let's just check the 5 volt reel anyway to make sure there's nothing shorted there. So those middle two, again, they'll both be ground. Or, well, I would have expected them to both be ground. On the data cable here, where it connects, the bottom row, it's all ground. So if I stick that in there, and yeah, okay. That one's a ground, but that one isn't. That's strange. But this one on the end, that is definitely 5 volt. And no, there's nothing shorted there. So that's fine. So what about the hard drive then? Because it definitely has 12 volt going to that. So Western Digital, model number WD93038-X. It does have a couple of defects on it. So anything shorted in here? Again, I would expect those middle two to both be ground. The blue wire probably is 12 volt. So I think that's the 12 volt line on 1.8 ohms. I would say that's close enough to a dead short. The 5 volt rail, well, that's fine. Let's give it the sniff test. Oh, she smells cooked. I can smell something. Yep. It has that telltale whiff of electronic smoke that has escaped. Let me see if I can get this PCB off. Well, look what I see. I'm pretty sure that's where the smell is coming from. It looks as if that inductor, it looks as if that's cooked. There's a burn mark on the side of it there. It almost looks like a little pinhole in the side of it too. 
and then something on the PCB here itself. I dare say that is where the smell is coming from. But I would not have thought the inductor to be the source of our potential short here. Although it isn't exactly a dead short, is it? I mean, it's one point something ohms. A dead short on this thing. Well, it typically reads about 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Although, that reading that we did get on this of 1.6. Well, I suppose if we take off that 0 0.5, well, that's just 1.1 ohms. I mean, it's as close as be damned to a dead short. So I do think this is our issue, but that inductor itself, well, that reads as a short across it, although those things will read like that on a multimeter. I don't see anything else on here with any obvious signs of any damage, but there certainly are a few tantalum capacitors, there's four of them there, and are they sitting on the 12 volt reel? Well, that one seems to be, and it has settled at that 1.7 again. What about this one? 1.7. This one here? Nope. That one must be on the 5 volt. No, it doesn't seem to be. Not sure what that one's doing. But this one down here. Well, that's settled at 1.4. So that is lower than those ones. And that would typically indicate that the short or the failing component is in this sort of area. Should we maybe remove that? Just to test it out of circuit? I'd also be tempted to remove that inductor because we should be able to test that as well. You know what, in the first instance, just let me cut a leg on this. Okay, with that removed, does that in any way affect our reading? No, that's okay. I didn't really think it would. Although, I do think it was worth checking, just because this has the heat damage to it. I can just push that back down, drop a wee bit of solder on that, and that'll be fine. But since I will need to get the soldering iron out to do that, I do next want to remove that tantalum. But I'm sitting here thinking, while I'm waiting for the soldering iron to heat up, what would be the problem? What would cause the hard drive to draw too much current on the 12 volt rail, causing whatever component it was here to blow out? That inductor, for example, or at least that's my theory anyway. And I think I may have found a culprit. So while this may not be the best practice, I am starting to think that this drive might just be beyond it. Because while I can spin the hard drive there, freely enough, spinning the platters, if I spin that quite quickly, well, I don't know if you'll be able to hear it or not, but there is a very rough sounding noise in there, almost as if it's the bearings are away. So I wonder, is that the cause of our failure? The stepper motor itself, it feels fine. And I really don't want to move that too far because obviously moving that, we are moving the heads across the platter. I don't want to cause any damage here if we could avoid it. It would be nice to at least try to get this going again. And I just wonder if we squirted a little bit of oil onto this point here. That's obviously the end of the motor, the shaft. Could it possibly work its way down there and maybe get into those bearings just to try and help it a bit? I'll just let that sit like that while we desolder that tantalum. So yeah, using two irons would be probably the quicker way of doing it, but I was just feeling lazy. If you do ever need to get something like that off and you've only got the one iron, just put a bit of fresh solder on it and go back and forward between the sides. It will soon fall off. And I suppose while we're here, let's just tack down that uh, inductor again. Even though I'm pretty sure that thing probably would need replaced, considering it looks as if it's let out some of its smoke anyway. But what has that done to the reading we were getting here on the meter? So still in continuity. Um, would you look at that? Our short is gone. 
What about that thing? Yeah. That is cooked. 22 microfarad, 16 volt. It always seems to be the case that it's the 16 volt tantalums on 12 volt rails that just go. No doubt you may have seen Adrian Black refer to that recently in a couple of his videos. But yeah, it does just seem to be the case that those 16 volt parts, they're maybe just a bit too close to the 12 volt of the supply rail itself. And so they tend to let go first. Let me see if I have a replacement for that. So unfortunately, no, I do not have a direct replacement for that. But I think what we might be able to get away with, just temporary anyway, is fitting an electrolytic there in its place. This one is 22 microfarad as well, but 25 volt. I will order a replacement tantalum for that. Well, that is if we can get this drive to spin up and if it works, I will order that. But it won't be a direct replacement 16 volt part, rather I will try and get a 25 volt tantalum to replace it. I just think that gives us that little bit extra headroom on the voltage drill. But let me try and get this mounted for now. It's not pretty but it should do the job just for a quick test and just wipe off that excess oil when I put on that. Still just does sound as noisy, but all we can do is try it. I'll reassemble the board and then we'll try and power this up on its own. I do have a little separate power supply for doing just that. Okay, will it spin up or will there be any more magic smoke? Here we go. So yeah, drive is spinning up. It's came up to speed. And you know what, it doesn't actually sound that bad now that it is spinning. Don't see any action out of the stepper motor though. But that's not to say that this maybe doesn't need to be connected to its controller to tell it to uh, initialize the heads. So I think the next thing we should do is reassemble all this into the case. And then we'll give it another try. See if the computer comes up and see if it boots to this hard drive. Well, it's all in there, even if it is sort of balancing, but I'm sure it'll be fine just for a quick test. I don't have the hard drive connected up yet, and just because I want to quickly test the computer as it is, just to make sure that it still works, that it comes up okay. I've got the keyboard connected up, but I'll just keep that on my knee here. So let's see what it says. Well, it certainly appears to be making all the right noises. Please wait. This all looks very familiar from when I previously had this turned on a couple of years ago now. It's beeping at me. And presumably that's because it doesn't have any batteries there. And it's looking for a system disk. Now, that is just a 720k disk drive. But I do have a copy of MS-DOS 3.3 here on a 720k disk. So let's put that in there and press the any key. The disk drive is quite quiet actually, but it is reading it and there it goes. Yeah, so everything here certainly seems to be fine. Shall we plug in the hard drive and see if it boots to that? So controller card in power is hooked up to the drive again. Let's see if it boots. Drive spinning up, but will it try to seek? Oh, I think I heard something. I think I heard the heads initialize. But it's just sitting on a black screen. Just with a cursor, what's going on? And there it goes. Oh yes, oh yes. So we've sorted the issue. It was just that dodgy capacitor. And it seems as if our cooked inductor there, well, certainly doesn't appear to stop it from working. So I guess I will have to go and order those replacement parts for that drive. And hopefully we can put that back into service full time. So it's running MS-DOS version 3.3, but that uh, prompt doesn't look right. Isn't that the right command? Yeah. 
what's on the drive. There's an awful lot in the root of that uh, C drive and just three directories by the look of it. XPRS boost and null. What's null? Null is nothing. What's boost? Could that be some sort of Amstrad utility? Could that be something to do with boosting the CPU speed here? Is there a turbo mode for this? What's in boost? There is an executable there. WSCOMV. Well, we're obviously not using that right. There is boost.com. What does that do? Hey, express boost. Oh, no, it's nothing to do with the Amstrad. It must be part of WordStar Express package. To activate modules, hold down the Alt key and press B twice. So Alt B B brings up a menu. Boost version one. Have an address book. Boost help. Calculator. Date stamp. What's that do? First of January, twenty eighty. Is our Amstrad from the future? Date stamp, notepad, print screen, reminder. Boost has nothing to remind you of. And time and date. Just showing us the time and date, which obviously isn't set. And wouldn't be remembered anyway because there's no batteries connected. How does a calculator work? Brings it up on the other side of the screen. And I assume it just uses the newer keypad. Yep, 2002125 divided by 25, yeah that works fine. Notepad, again just bring something up on the screen. Farts and things as LGR would say. And I heard it right to the drive there, so it doesn't remember that. Yes, it does. And I would have to assume that would be remembered even by the power cycle. So we'll just initialize that boost thing again. Alt BB, notepad. Yes, it does remember it even when the power's off. So that's definitely handy. Definitely a very handy little application that, isn't it? Just sits on top of DOS for when you need it. That other directory was XPRS. There's a program directory. Although I don't see any executables in there. There are a load of executables on the route of the C drive though. Although would most of them be what you'd expect to find in the DOS folder because there is no DOS folder. Which raises another point, there is no Windows folder. This machine when it chipped, I think would have had DOS 3.3 on it, but it also would have had possibly Windows 2, maybe Windows 3 on it. And there's certainly no signs of that. So I dare say this has all been wiped at some point in the past. WSX, yeah, WordStar Express, word processing. Looks like the last time this was used, someone opened autoexec.bat. You know, that was probably me when I was poking around this thing two years ago and there isn't a lot to see in that auto exact that bot. So I've had a quick look through the contents of the hard drive and I think there's only two files that we should probably consider keeping. Those being the park command that just parks the heads on this drive but it is Amstrad branded there as you see so obviously bespoke to this machine and there's a VGA test again Amstrad branded VGA graphic mode demonstration version 1.2 this lists the five graphic modes that presumably are paradise onboard VGA adapter supports so we've got CGA 320 by 200, four colors. We have EGA. 640 by 350, 16 colors. We've then got VGA. 
640 by 480 but just 16 colors. We've then got MCGA. And then the last one is PVGA. To be honest with you, I'm not really sure what this is. It seems similar to that MCGA, just at a higher resolution though. 640 by 400, 256 color. Whereas the MCGA has half that resolution. But yeah, outside of those two files, I'm not really sure what else on here is bespoke to this machine. If anyone sees anything listed there though, well, let me know and I will make a backup of it. There is a mouse driver there. And I do know that the mouse that this machine uses is sort of bespoke thing. So maybe we should hold on to that as well. But yeah, if there's anything else there that anyone sees, let me know. I'm not going to wipe the drive in this video. We'll do it next time. So there is time there. If there's anything that you see that I should hold on to, let me know. But while browsing the contents of this drive, I did stumble across a couple of personal files. Now, obviously I'm not going to show you the contents of that, but one of them was a CV written by someone who actually doesn't live that far away from where I am now, but it was written in 1998. I did not expect to find that date against it. You would have thought by that stage, something like this would have well and truly been out of service. It was definitely long out of date by then. But yeah, it seems someone was using it. And hopefully it did help them get whatever job it was that they were chasing at the time. But that's the computer all up and running. We do need to turn our attention to that monitor though. So this thing. Back when I first tested the monitor, when I first got this machine, as I said at the start of the video, it sort of started off with the screen image squished. And then over time that gradually got bigger to the point where it almost filled the entire screen. And to me, that sort of sounds like bad capacitors. Now, I don't much see the point in testing this at the minute because, you know, it's been sitting for a couple of years. It's not magically going to have fixed itself. Hence why I'm just jumping in and taking it apart. It does go without saying though, if you're not comfortable working inside a CRT, probably best not to take them apart. I will be honest and say I'm not overly comfortable working inside these things just because of the warning high voltage. But this hasn't been powered on for at least two years, so any residual voltage should have dissipated by now. We will, however, be testing that theory. So two screws out of the top of it there. And then there's two more on the bottom. We need to remove the brightness and the contrast knobs. And I think that's us in. Maybe. Oh no, I need to take one screw out of the back here. Beside the power switch. And that should be us in. There we are. So it's an Orion CRT. It is quite dusty in here. And oh dear, look what I see straight away. As I thought, this whole corner of the board here, it looks as if it's gotten wet. How's that gonna have got wet? Well, these capacitors down here, I think they've leaked. And in particular, that one. That is rather nasty looking down in there. Now to inspect this properly and indeed to do the recap, obviously we're going to have to get this board out. Which unfortunately means having to remove the scurry bits, in particular the anode cap here, coming from the flyback. But as I said, this hasn't been powered on for so long that I would expect there to be no residual charge. We're not going to take any chances though, so let me hook up a rig for discharging this. So my rather sketchy approach to this is one flat headed screwdriver with a bit of wire running down to the chassis of the monitor. We'll stick that in underneath the anode cap and just get it to touch the metal. That should be it. You would hear a crack out of it if there was any charge in it. I didn't hear anything at all there. 
But to be honest with you, I'm not expecting it because as I say, this hasn't been turned on for so long. So we can remove the anode cap now. There we are. Carefully remove the neck board from the CRT. And remove these wires. I think these go to that thing. That's the deflection yoke, is it? I'm not completely au fait with the internals of a CRT. I can pull that ground off there as well. There's a ground strap here that we need to remove. And then this wire goes to the LED on the front. It unplugs from the PCB down there, but I need to fish all these wires out of this thing. Oh, this needs to be disconnected as well. That's going to the degauze coil. Again, I think that's what it's called. And I think that's it. This PCB should now slide out. There's a catch here in the plastic that's stopping it though, so I need to sort of pull that forward. And then I think that's us out. There we are. And yeah, definite leakage going on. In fact, it's rather nasty looking, isn't it? Look at all that gunk. That's all out of the caps. So the more I look at this, the more I'm convinced the only capacitor that has leaked here is that one. There is nasty gunk all around the bottom of that. But all the rest of these, they do seem fine. And the extent of the staining on the board, well, it's sort of centered around that one. It sort of comes down in that sort of pattern there. But that is... 35 volt 2200 microfarad. I have plenty of 2200s, but none of them are 35 volt. In fact, they're all 25 or 16, so they ain't gonna do. I'm gonna have to go shopping. In the meantime, though, I think we could pull that out. And just while I'm waiting for the iron to heat up, one thing just to mention very quickly. Yes, we did discharge this thing, but on the CRT boards, the other significant danger, the other risk, is these large bulk capacitors. More so on the AC side of the thing, I would say. Because those big things, they will hold their charge for quite a while and they will give you quite the wallop. So if you are going to be doing something like this, please be careful. It really is one of those things. The same as working inside a power supply. It's one of those things, if you're not comfortable doing it, just don't. The offending capacitor lives between those two points. These are just single sided boards so this should come out easily enough. The only issue really is getting the heat into it because a lot of these traces are quite big. But there's it out. It absolutely stinks and without any question that has really badly leaked. A Rubicon too. So a well respected brand. But I suppose it is, what, 40 years old? So I think it can be excused. I'm going to mix a little bit of clean solder into all that. We'll hit it with a little bit of flux. And then some braid. We'll just clean it up. IPA just to get rid of the residue. And we'll do the same on the other side. It's so nasty looking. In fact, this whole area here just needs a really good scrub. Because as I have found out from past experience, this leaked electrolytic, it can cause all sorts of mayhem on these CRT boards. It can cause shorts between different components which in itself will stop the CRT from working properly. Well, obviously, let alone the fact that the capacitors on it are uh, field. In fact, it's probably more a job for just pouring it over it and giving it a bit of a go over with the toothbrush. That's about as good as I can get it. So just waiting on the postman to deliver a new one of these. But I thought we could test this. I mean, let's 
it is toast look at the state of it well let's just see how badly gone it really is and we can use the ESR meter that Sean kindly donated so we'll zero this out first of all and then attach it to these so we've got an ESR of 0.938 good if the capacitor is less than 200 microfarad uh, yeah not quite decimal points in the wrong place there this thing is 2200 but as we already knew this one is for the bin two days later so it is and we've got some new components new tantalums and inductors for that hard drive but more importantly we have new capacitors for this board nice shiny new Panasonic and that will go in there but just before we do solder that into position I was having another think about this whole area and the fact that it got soaked in spilt electrolytic well there's five trim pots down here and I'm sure they got dosed with that stuff but these are labelled V size H hold H position and those two are V size as well now truth told I'm not really sure why there are three vertical size trim pots but it was the vertical that was showing problems and it was all squished at the start and so yeah it most likely was that capacitor but I do think it would be worth a blast of contact cleaner just in and around those trim pots just to be sure that there's no issues with those and we'll just work these back and forward a wee bit now I think I have returned those to their original position but I'm sure we could always adjust it with the set running should we need to now this thing that will go in there or in fact no it won't it has been a couple of days and just as well I checked the footage I had recorded before because that actually goes in that orientation negative leg that road isn't it just as well I checked that because I know you lot love to see fireworks me on the other hand well I'm not so keen on them So almost time to test it but I am getting a little suspicious of one more capacitor here and it's in that one and that's just because the base of that just in that sort of area there it is looking quite wet as well now what I'm not sure of is what I'm looking at is that from the old cap that was there or has that one leaked as well I'm not going to do a full recap of this board uh, mostly because all these blue caps these rubicons I don't think I have ever seen one of those capacitors give problems and certainly none of those ones you know up around here for example none of them look as if they've leaked those are actually the same brand and type of capacitors that I used on the old Amiga 500s and yeah I have never seen one of those go bad yet granted in a monitor probably running quite a bit hotter so yeah a recap you know it's not going to do any harm but for now anyway I'm just going to leave it I am going to pull that one out though just to uh, test it this one may have leaked because there was a whiff of electrolytic there and as I was walking that cap out that pad on that side there that has lifted off the board didn't put any force on it I was just walking it out gently and that just lifted away shall we try it in the tester um, well yeah look at that according to this 0.5 ohms ESR good if capacitor less than 200 microfarad this cap is more than that so this one is potentially bad maybe this thing does need a full recap after all so I have hunted the place and I do not have a replacement 330 microfire cap but I've been thinking about this I don't think it's that far out of spec that it's maybe causing any problems so I'm going to chance it we're just going to put this back in 
I've went ahead and reassembled the monitor, although the back case is still off it. And that's just so we can keep an eye out for fireworks, although fingers crossed it'll be fine. So shall we start with that? Power button. No initial fireworks, nope. Something's going pop though. Might just be dust. How about we power up the PC? Let's let me spin this back round again. I can't see the heater in the CRT. It has started, so hopefully that's a good sign. Do we get a display? Well, yes, it does look like it is displaying and it does look like it's displaying the image at the full vertical height of this screen, but it's incredibly dim. Let me see if I can adjust that. The brightness and contrast controls are on the side of the monitor, just at the back here. And that is both those controls maxed out. Yeah, I sort of worry that our CRT here might be a little bit tired. How about we run that VGA test? So number one, CGA. Now that's a nice vibrant picture. Although granted, I do have those controls maxed out at the minute. EGA. And again, that looks pretty good. VGA, and it's rolling the image. Oh dear, that's not so good. MCGA, well, that one looks fine. Uh, number five, PVGA. And again, yeah, it looks okay, although there was almost like a bit of snow or something there just on the screen while it was drawing that. That VGA though, why is that rolling? I think there is a knob on the back of the monitor to maybe adjust that. I will have to be careful here though because, well, the back isn't on this thing. There we are. That's a lot better. And yeah, that does look pretty good. Looks like there might be a little scratch on the CRT there, but I suppose given its age, one little blemish might not be too bad. I am though a little worried about this brightness. How about we try and run something else? So on this old Amiga format disc, I have written a copy of LM60. Let's see what the performance of our Amstrad is. And this computer performs like a 5 megahertz AT. But one thing I'm noticing here, is it just me or does the text look a little bit out of focus? I mean I can read it okay just because of the size of the text, but it definitely could be sharper. I wonder is that maybe a symptom of us driving the screen too hard? As I said, I do have the brightness and the contrast maxed out. Rolling that back a bit, yeah, that's more like it in terms of sharpness. But the screen does get noticeably duller. Now there are those couple of trim pots on the board. Although at the minute, all I really have is a metal screwdriver. I suppose we could try and be careful. Ideally, you would want something plastic or ceramic or something like that to adjust those things while this is running. The ones all on this side of the board down here, well they were all just for the vertical and horizontal size. Vertical size does look pretty good. Horizontal, I wonder is there anything there that we can tweak. Let me spin this around a bit. The PSU fan just seemed to have stepped up a gear. Not really sure why. So what's this one? Okay, so that's vertical size, but the vertical does look okay. And then, no, sorry, it's just horizontal hold. 
and then horizontal position. There doesn't actually appear to be a trim pot for scaling the horizontal. So this is probably all we're going to get out of it. There is a sub brightness trim pot on this side. I wonder if we tried to carefully adjust that, could we get a bit more brightness out of this? Uh, not really. That is pretty much tweaked up as high as you could go before you're starting to blow out the image. Well, that seems to be about as good an image as I can get at the minute, although it is a little bit dim. But, as we all know, the CRT, it is a consumable item. It does have a finite lifespan. And judging by the amount of dust that was in this one, well, that's maybe evidence to the fact that this has had a lot of use. And this tube in particular, this may well be getting towards the end of its life. Now, I could try and recap the rest of the board, but to be honest with you, I would find it very unlikely it will do anything to the brightness on the screen here. Although, maybe I'm being a bit harsh because, you know, it's not that bad. Could be better, but it's definitely not the worst. And if I dim the lights down in here, you know, this screen probably would be okay for playing a couple of old DOS games. I just wouldn't fancy sitting in front of it doing any word processing for any length of time. Certainly wouldn't want to write a CV sitting in front of this. But for a couple of early games, yeah, it probably would be alright, to be honest. So I think we'll just close this video off at that. We have the computer fixed, it's running again and booting from its hard drive. And we've got the vertical issues sorted out with the monitor. Would it be worth going back in and recapping the rest of that monitor? I'm not sure, let me know what you think. But there is plenty of other things that I want to do with this machine as well. Cosmetically, it definitely could use a bit of a going over. Things have yellowed a little bit here and there's a few marks and whatnot on the case, plus that rust to deal with. And then after that, it's gonna be thinking about upgrades because we do have three spur ISA slots in there. Granted, they're only 8-bit ISA slots, but they're still there begging for some cards to be inserted. So what could we put in to expand the usability of this machine? Well, that's going to be it for part one. So if you enjoyed what you've seen, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Why not hit subscribe if you haven't done so already? Still plenty more yet to come here on CRG. It's going to be at least another couple of videos on this machine. And I'll see you next time.